just put your thumbs up so I can get an idea of if also those not on video, maybe just give me an idea. It seems like we have some people who definitely have some experience here. Fantastic. So what the IDGs are doing is they're providing a framework for inner development. They're providing um, what they are and also why we should be doing this. The why being clear, a more sustainable planet for people and climate as well. And another good thing to notice at this point, this is gaining a lot of momentum and a lot of steam internationally. But what is also happening right now is there's a second mega trend and I'm sure that you know what I'm talking about, digital transformation. And this is happening at the same time. And I just want to share at this point a quote from Andrew J. Scott, a professor, professor of economics at London Business School. As machines get better at being machines, humans have to get better at being human. And that's something that I have seen through all of my roles, be it, be it as a teacher, as a, profess as a um, professional coach, working in startups. It's always coming down to the human factor. How can we bring these competencies, this learning, to, for example, education in a way that is understandable, is hopefully enjoyable, um, but also scalable? And that's something that we're doing at Reflect. Tom, I don't know how I am for time just to share a sentence on that. You can still share that sentence. I can still share that sentence. Yeah. Yay. Because um, we will also in this panel be talking about how. How do we bring these communication frameworks um, into teaching, for example? And there are many different ways to do that. And I won't talk through all of these now. Maybe we'll talk about it a bit later. We have individual interventions, coaching, seminars, um, toolkits. I've got examples here that you can have a look at later. But what we're doing with Reflect is our ambition is to bring the inner development goals to universities and making it a core theme in all of the students' learning. So it's a web app. It's a technological solution that is full of features like self-reflection, self-assessment on the IDGs um, and peer coaching because learning these skills is not something that you do in a silo by yourself. It's something that you do with other people. And we're also investigating how can we ass assess these skills and how can we do this in education? Do, how do we give grades to competencies? Is that even an ethical thing to do? Or are we talking about a pass-fail situation? And because I'm first, I'm going to be cheeky and allow myself to share one more thing, if that's okay. <laughs> and that is a question for all of you. Go to Slido. You can use the QR code here. Have a look at the inner development goals and let us know what of these one to three skills are most important to you in your daily life or work. Now I've got these on the Miro board as well. Hello. And maybe, yes. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. We only see the framework still. Yeah. Yeah. You see the framework? Okay. I'm gonna share. Oh, I see. Never mind. Thank you for checking me. I have two screens, which is usually a very helpful thing, but sometimes um sometimes confuses the presenter. Here we go. Thank you for helping me there. Here are the questions. You have seen the framework. Which of these skills are most important for your daily life and work when it comes to the inner development goals? Be interesting to see your answer there. You can go to slido.com or use this QR code. And I'll also put it in the chat as well, just to make sure that everybody can access this. And while you're doing that, um, that, that was a long-winded way of introducing myself. I'm happy to be a co-founder and co-developer of this tool at Reflect. I'm also using the tool in my own um, Certificate of Advanced Studies in Switzerland. 
And I can say happily that a lot of my students really love it. That's personalizing their learning. They're reflecting on what they're doing. And they're also learning um, about the inner development goals. We have some people typing. And I'll leave this open. This is going to be on your mirror board. You can come back to this um, throughout the weekend as well if you would like to answer this, if you're watching the recording. And my fellow panelists um, would love for you to also share your answers if you feel comfortable to do so. Here we go. As you can see, even in a relatively small group, granted that we are from different parts of the world, we're all interested in sustainability. Interesting now to see what words are coming through. And I see that critical thinking is a big one for a lot of people here. I'll stop at that point. Thank you for engaging already with the question. Looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Okay, thank you, Ella, for uh, introducing us to the inner development goals. I think I would like to make the bridge now to the prime i5 framework, uh, Gustavo, um, because um, I, I've encountered it in one of the annual chapters of um, the prime Benelux uh, meetings. Um, and uh, I, I remember the words playful, uh, and I also remember the connection with, for instance, Lego. So can you, can you a little bit explain uh, what prime i5 is about and how your work relates to it? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Don. Uh, so uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever you are in the world. Um, so I'm Gustavo. I work for Prime Secretariat. I'm leading our um, leadership education programs here. Uh, and I'm, that's why I'm connected with I5. I joined the Secretariat last year, but I've been engaged with Hires Active Education the past uh, 10, 12 years. Uh, I was a professor and a sustainability coordinator at my business school. So I was engaged with Prime from the other side, from a business school perspective, I was also a, a chapter chair uh, for the Latin American Caribbean region uh, before I joined the Secretariat team and now working with different projects and also with I-5. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's the question is really interesting and, and I will like do a quick and short intro about why I-5 and, and what we're doing, what we're trying to develop around it and how this is connected with Lego research and et cetera. Um, one of the things, uh, Prime is an organization that was created uh, 15 years ago uh, under United Nations Global Compact uh, with intention of develop responsible leaders, uh, people that are able to deal with the challenges and issues that we had in society. Um, United Nations Global Compact looks to companies, business, how to commit business and engage in business and sustainability agenda. And Prime were created as an education harm looking to, to like uh, business leaders, how to better transform and better educate business leaders uh, inside companies. Um, last year, we did in, in uh, like small research about some educational data and we arrived in a number that is one in three um, some data from UNESCO show us that one in three, like thir almost 30% 30 of the world's tertiary education students to business, management, law, and economics. So are inside business schools. So this is like uh, about 7 million graduates per year. So business is the global largest field of higher education study. So it's a huge responsibility when we talk about uh, education business, uh, uh, like the work that business schools or even universities do when they are teaching future leaders. So, uh, um, so it matters what we do, what we teach, how we teach, how we discuss different topics inside of education space. Um, that said, uh, also part of this introduction, just would like to share two slides here with some um, additional data and information because I think this is important for the discussion that we're having here about different frameworks. Um, as I, I just said, like uh, Prime were created under 
United Nations Global Compact. So uh, we always observe what companies are doing, how they're committing. And uh, in the last year's CEO study, uh, it's a study created by UNGC and the Accenture company. 96% of CEOs reported that talent scarcity is a top global challenge in their business. That means um, to deal with the issues and challenges that we have with the SDGs, all the complexity, all the, 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 the challenge itself, uh, there's a gap of skills. So workforce is, workforce is not prepared to deal with that. Um, so they need to invest in recruiting people, but also in upskilling, reskilling, uh, keeping them prepared for the future labor market. So we have an issue here. Uh, we have the SDGs, we have all the climate commitments or sustainability commitments that companies in some cases do, but they don't have people that are capable to deal with that. They they report that some, some talent scarcity on it. But well, when we ask to universities, 96% of chief academic officers says that they are doing a good job preparing young people for, for like the workforce. So the university says that they're good, they're doing a good job, they're doing the right thing, they're preparing students, etc. But when we do the same question for uh, students or even business leaders, it's a bit different. So university says, well, we're doing a good job, we are preparing students, we are developing the, the, the skills that are needed to face the challenge that we have in society, so they're good for the market. But when we ask students, they say, well, not really. I don't feel that I'm that prepared to deal with the challenges and issues that I'm facing in the workspace. And even less of the business leaders share the same view on it. So there's a gap here. So if the university says that they are doing the right thing, but these students or even like the job market says that are not, so there's a gap in the way that we're teaching. So professors think that they're teaching right, that their students are, are observing or discussing or developing skills that are needed for the future, but it's not happening. And there, there's where uh, like I-5 came in. So um, the intention uh, of the program is really to look to the pedagogical approach, the way that faculty professors, the way that the responsible leadership and sustainability, et cetera, et cetera, I be, are being teaching inside business schools and how this is developing students or, or if they're not developing students in a proper way. Um, so uh, uh, my final is like here for intrude. Um, the vision of IFI is really create and support the development of leaders, future leaders or, or actual leaders that are equipped with holistic skills like cognitive, emotion, social, and physical. And, and that's really connected with, with what Ella just said about inner development goals because, well, we know the issues, we know the challenge, we know the SDGs for a while, we know all the problems that we have, and we know for a while uh, why we just don't solve that. Like, uh, what is, what's going on? Like, what is the issue here? So what we need to, to change is like the mindset, the way to deal with that. And um, and this point is important. That's why I've started talking about like uh, uh, the tertiary education and the business education, if you may. Uh, uh, because when we talk about sustainability, we always talk about the next generation. Like, oh, the kids will save the planet. The kids already know what to do. They're really empathetic with sustainability issues, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's a different mindset. But we need to change leaders right now. Like uh, our students that are going to job marketing, let's say one, two years, or like even the business leaders that are right now in, in, the, in the companies dealing with that. And those skills need to be developed because the technical skills are okay, but uh, we already know that. We can look into books, Google it, or AI, etc. But holistic skills are really important to develop and, and we understand this gap. And that's why like uh, I-5, it's from Impactful 5. Um, it came from past studies from Lego on playful learning or, or um, more uh, uh, creative learning, teaching, etc. So Lego is doing this for a while, um, and, and for many years we focus on of uh, um, children's education. Well, when you hear playful learning, etc., it's all connected to that, and of course connected to Lego bricks and etc., etc. And the differentiation of this program is that we're bringing that 
uh, for tertiary education, for uh, leadership education, for teaching others. So bringing playful learning to develop those skills, uh, those skill set. And that's why uh, uh, the Impactful Five came from. So last year we partnered, uh, last two years ago, two years ago we partnered with Harvard School of Education, uh, Project Zero, and also Solitas to develop this framework on, on how to better prepare professors for teaching responsible leadership, for teaching sustainability issues. So the focus here is just to transform the educators like it, showing, demonstrating that uh, different ways of teaching the same things in some case can develop it and transform different skill sets. And that's like the I-5 framework that I can, can present a little bit later on in, in the next interactions. Um, so I'll stop here for the moment. Okay, thank you very much, Gustavo, for uh, highlighting this gap. Um, that's also um, something that companies pinpointed to us. Um, I'm also teaching in... Uh, in the faculty of business economics and uh well the companies they say yeah um there is this european green deal but your students are not prepared for that um and, and yeah um, that's a little bit of pity i think i think uh Peronimo, maybe i i would give the word would like to give the word to you because i think um from the preparations that that you made that you also experienced a gap at some point and I was wondering when was it that you noticed um, there was a gap um, can you talk a little bit about that yeah and 100%. Yourself, of course <laughs> yeah yeah 100 firstly I'd just like to say that Gustavo and Ella the work that you both are doing is wonderful and it is super necessary the power of reflection is extremely extremely um, great and I would love to be able to touch on that a little bit later and Gustavo the whole notion of embedding sustainability across business education uh, touches a close string to me. And um, uh, maybe I'll share a little bit of the story about how I got here. Um, so last year, I graduated with a Bachelor of Business Administration and a quick minor in economics. And throughout my degree, um, I really felt that the culture and the academic experiences that I was exposed to really inspired me to pursue maybe more of the traditional career paths in fields like investment banking, consulting, and the consumer goods sector. And as I was entering my last year of business school, I really thought to myself, okay, I'm going to have a long career in one of these fields at least. Um, but that year I made you know, a pretty inconsequential decision to take an elective business course that was titled Business Strategy for Sustainability. And throughout that course, I really think I found myself immersed in this new way of thinking that I really considered the ecological and social factors uh, to consider when running a business. And, you know, the world and the role of business within it was for once kind of presented with a certain degree of uncertainty, which is actually quite different, as some of you know, from some of the way that business is presented in other courses, which really kind of outline maybe clear problem sets with clear outcomes, like finding equilibrium, what is exactly the break-even point. And, Anyways, this elective course really kind of sparked a longer journey to slowly uncover how complex the situation that we are in truly is. Like, it's been crazy to, to realize that how we consume and how we supply energy needs to be radically reformed, how we think about economic growth and capitalism needs to be at least questioned, um, you know, the role of biodiversity and ecosystem services needs to be valued, all these other factors of just realizing, okay, there's a lot of rethinking that needs to be done. And that's when the process of internal change and internal discovery kind of started. Um, and I guess really questioning the values that I had grown to embrace throughout that time. And to be honest, it hasn't been easy. Uh, for instance, trying to decouple, you know, my self-worth, my identity with some of the factors that society really values like salary and prestige uh, to instead prioritizing variables like, you know, creating positive value for other humans and the environment. Uh, has brought forth some internal battles, but I think this is where I've kind of found value in um, some of these frameworks that they're that are being presented today. And I really hope to be able to leverage them more throughout my career. Um, and last year, I found an organization called Regeneration, which is an organization that uh, kind of gathers a group of other business students from across the country who are also kind of dealing with these internal processes of change. And I've been working with that organization over the last year, trying to support uh, like-minded stu like students. I've been nourishing this online community where we can all come together and discuss these issues. 
um, share knowledge and really just kind of discuss like what are our career outlooks, um, what are potential career uh, avenues and what are some important frameworks such as these ones which need to be embedded across business education? How can we advocate for these frameworks to be further embedded? Um, and yeah, it's a little bit more about myself. Happy to be here and learn a little bit more. Okay, thank you for sharing about your uh, internal battles, Geronimo. <laughs> um, I, I would like to, to bring the word now to Simon, because uh, Simon, uh, you didn't uh, get a chance to propose yourself yet, um, but I think you wanted to, what you will bring is somehow a synthesis maybe also from what has been said by the three other panelists uh, before. Go ahead. Yeah, we will see. Thank you, Tom. Um, in WWF Switzerland, I'm responsible for higher education. We promote this uh, sustainability and um, education for sustainable development at Swiss universities with different approaches, uh, with conferences, with tools, with platforms, with newsletters, and with uh, also with um, uh, concrete projects with some universities. And at the beginning, Tom, you asked about um, frameworks. And uh, that's a very interesting question to me. Because uh, on one hand, uh, I think it's very important uh, for inspiring and orientation and so on. And on the other hand, it's for me, it's uh, quite difficult to choose the right or the most useful a framework uh, to to work about about it. So that's a little bit um, attention uh, also. Maybe I can uh, just show uh, you uh, what we the, the framework or if you want to so what what what, what we have. Um, sorry, bigger and then I hope I like this i hope you can see it now is it okay can you see this slide okay this is what um, we... simon mm -hmm. sorry um we can see it but we can see the notes side uh, uh okay then uh i i think i can um, swap yep. <laughs> perfect uh, now it's better okay thank you very much here uh, you can see what what we want we have um uh, with this, I would uh, like to add uh, our target model uh, from the perspective uh, of education for sustainable development, ESD, in universities. We distinguish uh, between three target areas, the generalistic knowledge and understanding of sustainable uh, development, uh, that's here uh, in blue, the discipline-specific knowledge and understanding of sustainable development in red, and in particular, the key competences for sustainable development. The prerequisites for achieving the objectives are a holistic approach and competence promoting teaching and learning methods. And now I uh, go to this uh, model of key competences for sustainable development. Um, this is a model from UNESCO. Um, there are of course, there are various uh, ESD competence models. Here is this uh, UNESCO model from 2017 with eight areas of competence. Um, we have su uh, supplement uh, it with the three classic and overarching competence dim dimensions of Proclaim. You can see here uh, it's system thinking competency, target competency, and most important transformation competency. You can clearly see that there are many references to the approaches uh, presented before. Um, I think uh, this normative competency, also strategic competency. Um, then in the uh, survey, um, this critical, also critical thinking is important. And also more personal, this self-awareness competence is also uh, a, part, a part of it. So that... But that's what we use. I'm not sure if it's the, the best, the use, most useful, uh, uh, but it is from UNESCO. And I think so it's international and it gives a little bit uh, yeah, authority or something like this. 
I think for the moment it's yeah. <laughs> enough. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. I, I think I, I also really liked what you said in the beginning when you started uh, pre presenting yourself in the framework uh, that you use at WWF, um, it, that it's difficult to choose the right framework. And that's something that, uh, that I'm as a teacher also uh, very often confronted with. Uh, also as a teacher trainer, I sometimes want to share these frameworks with my students and I don't know uh, yeah, which is the best one. Um, you cannot share them all because less is more sometimes in education. So, um, uh, yeah. And, and it also reminds me of something you said, Ella. Um, you said like, well, uh, the IDGs are a kind of um, common language that we want to provide um, so that we synthesize somehow um, existing frameworks. Um, but that's also something that the European Commission, for instance, uh, uh, claims to do with their Green Comp uh, sustainability framework. Uh, they developed the Green Competence framework. Uh, so if I would ask you to, to now you've listened to each other, um, how you compare the frameworks that have been presented here, um, what, are, what are the differences, what are the overlaps um, between the frameworks you bring, but maybe also with Green Comp or other frameworks um, can you can you pinpoint that? Um, I don't know. Maybe uh, we can start with you again, Ella. Yeah, thank you, Gustavo, Simon, and Hieronimo. Really lovely to hear um, your take on things. I also appreciate that we have um, these. We're looking at these frameworks, but we can still be critical about them. And as we've seen, Simon said it. Um, we saw it also in the Slido survey. We need to be critical. And we also need to be open when we're looking at these frameworks. Um, with uh, the I-5 model, the first thing, Gustavo, that I noticed is we're coming from the same, the problem is maybe the same, is that we have the know-how, we have the skills and the technological skills to achieve the sustainable development goals. What we need is, and this is where we need to decide on the language um, or discuss it, is the mindset, the attitudes, the skills to make it happen. And you spoke about, Gustavo, you spoke about holistic skills, which I love. Other language that you hear a lot these days are human skills, um, especially when we're talking about man and machine, the human skills that we need. Um, but I also love how uh, actionable it is. You're taking a pedagogical, it's a hard word, uh, approach. Um, in a very specific area and you're transforming educators which arguably are creating a positive ripple effect so the amplification of that model and that way of, way of going about it I find really wonderful and that's something that I try to do in my teaching as well is empower others to be a part of that positive ripple effect that's the first thing that came to me Kadonimo, I love that you talked about uncertainty uh, we're rife with it what are the skills that we need to combat uncertainty, to deal with it, to be okay with it. And Simon, what I really loved um, about yours is we saw with the IDGs and what you shared as well, there are a lot of a lot of similarities and self-awareness being one of the big ones too. Um, so I loved seeing the synergies, but I also recognize where they're different and where they also complement each other. I'm wondering what everyone else and what maybe the listeners also um, who are here today, what they notice too. Okay, um, thank you, Ella. Um, Gustavo, Simon, Geronimo, anyone of you uh, would like to react first? Yeah, I can uh, uh, add a little bit. And it's it's more under a comment. Um, it's it's really interesting to see the approach of the presentations, and and it's really important, uh, I guess, because um, as I said, for many years we've been discussing, uh, like the challenge that we have in society, like the social programs, economic programs, et cetera, et cetera, environmental issues uh, for a while that we have. Uh, and then we came with the SDGs, et cetera. We had a lot of scientific publications talking about the issues and the problem. And what I really like here from all the presentations and what we hear, it's because we're talking about human, like our, our role on it, like uh, how to take some action on it. How do, how can we, transform let's say ourselves to deal with that and and this is fundamental and is really different uh, on what we've been seeing the past few years uh because we always say well 
the issue is there, but why we're not solving? Like why why we're not solving the issue? Why we're not solving the problems, etc. And we've been teaching about this for many years. Uh, we talk about climate change for many years. We talk about societal issues for many years, and still happening. Uh, so I think the topic of this panel and all the discussion is really important on it. Um, so it's, it's, it's more a comment, my perspective, and, and how important is the topic and, and, and how innovative is this kind of discussion. Maybe it's, it's not so important uh, what uh, exactly what um, framework uh, we use. I think very much more important is to really integrate it in a very central uh, uh, place in, in the curriculum. Uh, what, what I can see is um, at some universities, they uh, make their, um, th th their study degrees, um, maybe um, hardcore uh, business education. And then in one module, there are came inner development goals or what, what else and i think that's not what we use and uh, as a little add-on that's not uh, useful so i think uh, the real yeah the, the challenge is is to really integrate it into the whole um curriculum in the in, in the whole, whole uh, program okay thank you uh simon um Geronimo, do you want to react uh, or do I phone? Well, yeah, no, I'd just like to, uh, I guess, echo what Simone just stated. It's so critically important to have sustainability holistically integrated throughout all the mandatory components of a business degree and all other degrees. Um, we recently just uh, conducted a survey uh, asking around 750 business students to what extent they felt sustainability was integrated throughout the, their common core. And uh, if you guys can quickly see uh, the results right here, like like the majority really feel that sustainability was not integrated throughout their common core. Um, so, you know, a lot of students share that sentiment and I'm sure a lot of the individuals here in this room do as well. Okay, thank you, Geronimo. And, and I think it's, it's um, I would like to link back to that centrality of uh, these uh, inner development goals of sustainability competences. Um, at some point, the university I am working for, they actually chose to um, to put the sustainability competences at the heart of our, our competence framework that we use in our university. Well, that's the first step. It's the policy plan. But now we have to put it into practice, of course. And so I was actually wondering, um, you know, we, we have been talking about these frameworks. Um, what about the teacher skills? Uh, do they need specific skills to be able to translate these frameworks into practice? Um, can you can can you reflect on that? Maybe Simon, you can go first. Sorry, thank you. Um, yes, I think that they need uh, the first. I think it's uh, another um, role understanding. If, if you teach uh, really in, in the sense of uh, ESD, uh, Education for Sustainable Development, then it's a really a, a learner-centered approach. And so you are then not the expert and the, the, the big professor, you are the coach and, uh, and you learn too, of course. The, for me, the ideal uh, situation is a triangle between the faculty academic people, students, and um, partners from outside university. That means really this uh, transdisciplinary approach also, also. Uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the the same level and, and really in interaction and all can learn from each other. Um, that is, for example, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the approach of um, search learning, it's very important to, to learn like, like this. And then you can you you can um, use different um, frameworks. It, it's not so so important, but I think then you can really develop uh, competences and uh, of, of all uh, these participants. <laughs> okay, thank you for bringing back us back to the central theme of this conference, like this learner-driven mindset. So that's an important skill of a teacher, I think. 
Is there anything uh, you would like to add, uh, Gustavo, because you have been working on this pedagogical approach mainly? Uh, can you reflect on, on that from, from that perspective? Towards yeah. The yeah, I let me just share another screen here that demonstrate the framework itself and some actions related to, to it. Because um, I think one, the challenge that we have uh, on, on the i5 is really uh, it's stimulate and, and how to connect and how to uh, engage faculty and transform the way that they teach. Uh, because uh, faculty mindset is really under, well, I know what I'm doing, I'm getting results, our students are, are good. And as I just shared in the, the first uh, one of the data slides, like, the institution, the university thinks they are doing a good work for many years. Uh, so our main challenge is really the invitation to faculty to change because we also know that faculty professors are really busy because they need to do research, they have administrative things to do and et cetera, et cetera. And we're now saying, okay, but you also need to change the way that you teach. Like you need to learn a different thing and you need to reflect in your pedagogical practice so you can be a, a better faculty and professor. So the, the issue is here. Uh, but the intention with the I-5 framework, it's, it's of course, uh, uh, look into practice that are already happening because faculty all around the world are already doing amazing pedagogical innovate, innovative approach for teaching. Uh, but we're trying to translate this in a framework so people can connect, interact, and understand and improve their, their pedagogical approach. And here you may see, for example, uh, uh, the framework, as I said, like make learning meaningful, foster joy and well-being, and design for iteration, et cetera, et cetera, and some kind of activities that may happen inside classroom. Um, so the the I-5 and, and what we're doing now is trying to engage professors more and more on it. And um, on pitch moment, you can also access the playbook uh, uh, through this QR code. I can, I can put the link on the chat later on. Uh, but the playbook is a document when you have all the research piece of the I-5 framework and a bunch of examples flown all around the world on professors doing uh, some kind of activities and interventions and, and this and this different approach. Uh, and we are now learning like the change and we're just understanding right now the, the I-5 framework is really new. Uh, we launched a playbook in June this year. Uh, so we're now observing this transformation to understand how this is developing the skills because until now it's of course is a hypothesis uh, we think and we understand we fundamentally the research about this transformation. And now we need to see the, the change. We're also partnering with, with OICOS uh, and LA Research Project also to push this forward. Uh, that would be really amazing. So uh, we see under this development to, to understand the transformation. But going back to the challenge and the issue, I think faculty transformation, like faculty mindset, faculty understanding that they need to change and they need to revise the way that they teach is our, our, our main issue right now, uh, uh, this invitation for transformation and, and competing with all the, the workload that faculty have inside institutions and business schools. Gustavo, how do you reach and involve uh, lecturers and the academic people? What, what's, what are your tools for this? Yeah. Uh, uh, as as Prime is like a, a, a network organization, so we are, are all around the world. We have uh, uh, chapters, we're divided by chapters, by regions. We have institutions that are signatories. So our outreach is under those chapters, like uh, chapters can organize, let's say, workshops or different activities in regional level to engage in inviting faculty to, to the conversation and also through online webinars. But it's really, uh, let's say, say networking power, network power. So through chapters and different regions and inviting faculty and faculty, inviting other faculty to join the conversation that way, uh, inviting colleagues and say, hey, this is nice. It connects with what you're doing in your classroom. Take a look on this. So it's under this, this process right now, but intentions really roll out this uh, a little bit more. Thank you for uh, for the discussion, Simon and Gustavo. Um, I'd like to ask question the same question to Geronimo. Um, from your experience as a student, what's what teacher skills um, 
do you think were necessary um, for your teachers? Um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure if I can provide that much insight on particular skills that teachers can try to embrace, but perhaps I can share some activities that really kind of uh, supported me along the inner development journey. And perhaps the other panelists could, could comment on how to uh, obtain skills which facilitate uh, engaging in those types of activities. Um, so I think first, one of the key activities has been really emphasizing and prioritizing self-reflection. Um, that process of internal change for me has been, you know, heavily influenced by taking a book and just going through the process of thinking and reflecting. And oftentimes it's so easy while you're doing that activity to get so fixated on the amount of words that you're putting on the piece of paper, or like what you're actually writing. But I realized that the majority of the value has just come from sitting there and actually just thinking. So how do we facilitate that process, that moment of just thinking? Uh, I think is is kind of the first key key thing that I would love to ask. And then the second uh, activity that's really helped is um, just creating a space for genuine and exploratory conversations. So by that, I mean uh, dialogues where people around me really don't pretend to have all the answers and where preconceptions are just put down for a moment. Because in those conversations are where I've learned a little bit more about what it means to be open, what it means to be vulnerable, what it means to embrace complexity. Um, so without really having the pressure of having the right answer. So what skills do you guys think uh, some educators could embrace to, emb like, I guess, further enhance reflection and create open spaces for exploratory conversation? I think that was very valuable, Geronimo. Even if when you're not a teacher yourself, um, that's uh, I think these are very important activities that should be facilitated by teachers. Um, maybe, Ella, do you... I think you wanted uh, to show the reflect tool maybe somehow as well eh? to uh, yeah, show it, how teachers uh, can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Geronimo, thank you. You threw me a bit of a ball there um, in terms of the importance of self-reflection. And that's something that we've recognized um, as co-founders through our own personal development journeys, but also as teachers. And the question that I'm hearing bubbling up here is, okay, there are lots of individual interventions that we know really work. Um, I'll just show I'll just show my screen again, hopefully correctly this time. And so we have we have individual interventions, and here are some links um, to also using the IDGs. And we have some wonderful toolkits being developed as well for how you can bring these skills, these competencies into your teaching. So hopefully we can share these slides with you later. There's also a, um, a B, so B2C, this is business language, but essentially there's a free downloadable app that was created by 29K that is also encouraging people to self-reflect as well. Cool. And what we're, um, at Reflect, what we're seeing is there's a huge appetite to bring this to more students um, at a more, in a more scalable way because coaching is really wonderful and, and effective, but it's very expensive and you require expertise to be a coach or to coach a group of people. How can we bring that know-how to lecturers who even don't have those competencies themselves but are willing to integrate this way of learning into their programs. So the idea is how can we bring these IDGs or personal development competencies into teaching through a Trojan horse, um, even for those who are maybe more passive or on the fence about, uh, about this here. And so I'd like to share at this point um, a demo of Reflect really, really briefly, high level, just to give you a little insight into what this looks like. And you can imagine for yourselves how that might work if you're in teaching or even as a student, what that would be like using it yourself. So what you can see here, um, it's very clean, very simple, very intuitive. This is my um, dashboard and reflect as a lecturer. So I have a group of students and I want to feed in reflection into their six month program, their bachelors, maybe even just a module of one. The vision is that this can be integrated in certificate of advanced studies, shorter leadership programs, but also bachelor's and master's degrees. So what we have here is we have a self-assessment based on the different five dimensions that students can fill out themselves. How confident do they feel 
with their ability to deal with stress? How much is sustainability part of their core values in life? What's important to them? And what are their own uh, personal learning goals for the course that they're in? And we have essentially a catalog of self-reflection questions. For example, getting started at the beginning of a program. Hey, what are you most excited about? What are you concerned about? What are your personal learning goals for this particular program that you're in? And as you can see, you can edit this for any content. This could be in a business-related program or indeed in a sustainability program as well. And you can add self-reflection self questions like these. You can also add peer coaching because reflection can also be social. And we've um, seen wonderful feedback coming back from the peer coaching because students get to learn coaching as a skill, learn um, uh, deep listening, reflecting back, and knowing that they don't have to have the solutions for their peers, but really just to be there. So they're learning these skills um, at a much earlier age than I got to learn these skills. I got till 27 until I got to learn anything about coaching. So we're feeding this in as well. And I just want to show you, this is my course. We're currently using Reflect. This is in Switzerland. And for me as a teacher, the cool thing is, is I can see how strong do my students feel in these different competencies? Where might I want to, um, where might I support them better? For example, under social skills. How confident do you feel with your ability to treat yourself with compassion and respect? Emotional maturity, how confident are you in your ability to deal with conflict? We see that there's potential here. So when I get this information as a lecturer, I can even integrate um, some more support in that direction and conflict management, for example, into my course. And the last thing that I'll show is that if we're talking about grading and assessment, um, I have made reflect part of uh, the grading process in my program. It is currently pass fail. And so I ask my students to complete 80% of the reflections and reflect. They do this over six months. And as you can see, when I make it mandatory, uh, the, the, the motivation is pretty high to, for them to actually do this. We're working on other ways to assess, for example, peer. So we have the self assessment, peer assessment. We are looking into how we might do this ethically with an AI solution, and of course, the lecturer as well. So the idea is that with this tool, any lecturer of any program could essentially get this and add it to their already existing curriculum. And if they need more input, they can get it directly from us. But for those of you, for example, in this room who are already really well-versed with sustainability, and within the development, this would be, um, I think, quite an interesting playground for you to bring in your own knowledge and your own exercises as well. So I think it helps just to get a visual of what you can expect with the tool. Okay, thank and you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you so much for letting me do that. It's always fun to share it and to use it as a teacher. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that, Ella. It, indeed, it, uh, it, it shows how, how it can work as a self-assessment tool. Um, based on discussions we had before, you were referring to AI. So I was wondering about what function AI can play in, in this assessment procedure. And maybe another dimension that I would like to tap upon is um, how much room is there for the student um, to add things to it? Because these questions have been prepared by, by you or by the teachers. Uh, how much room is there for students, really student-driven uh, assessment, uh, uh, not only by filling out the questions. So these two dimensions, like what is the role of AI? Can you explain a little bit on that? And how much room is there for students to have more control? Um... Yeah, wonderful questions. And these are questions that our partners, our university partners really care about. Um, how can we bring in AI in an ethical way? Because the thing about AI is, sure, we can use it legally, but should we use it? And so we haven't answered that question for ourselves fully yet. One area where we see we can very quickly um, use the support of generative AI is for lecturers to put in their theme or their module 
and based off that receive 20 reflection questions. You know, we can imagine the, the, the generation of content on the, on the teacher side being much easier. Summarizing of reflections so that uh, lecturers can feed back. Okay, guys, these are the key points that you came up to. What do you think about this? So that's something that we're currently looking at, but we haven't um, integrated yet. Again, we want to be really mindful about how we do this. And if it's the right way to do it, not just to do it because everyone wants to <laughs> right now. Um, your other point, and I just need to um, remind myself of what that is. Yes, how can we make this more of a co-creative process? And so what we're seeing is there's a real desire for the students to be able to share their reflections with each other and to even set their own reflection questions. And another thing that we've added is we've added an actions module so students can reflect and they're like, I really want to do something about this reflection because reflection is not reflection without an action. It's just thinking. So we need to actually integrate that into a conscious action. So we now have, a, a, you can't see that from this dashboard, but students can create actions and receive daily reminders for them too. So that's also something that we're doing to make it more student-led because I agree that will be more of the future when it comes to our tool. It's going to be more student-driven. Right now, the context is the program, the course, directed by the lecturer. But our long-term vision for Reflect is that Reflect becomes a cockpit or a digital coach for students that they can use for any phase of their lives. So let's say it could become the LinkedIn for personal development. This is our long-term goal, is that people could use Reflect when they're starting a new job, reflect on what's going on there. When they, um, when they have kids and they want to reflect around that. So this is the bigger vision for Reflect that it will become more user-led. But we're not there yet. We're starting with our Trojan horse in education and excited to see where it goes from there. Thank you. It's also uh, very nice to see that the actions uh, are not necessarily defined by the teachers, but the students then have uh, something to say about it. I think that's really important. Um, does that resonate um, with the other panelists? Um, I am wondering, uh, Gustavo, Simon, Geronimo, um, how, how do you feel about assessing these kind of skills in higher education? Um, do you want to share something about that? Yeah, in, in, in our case with i5, uh, at the same time that we started uh, building the i5 playbook, uh, we started to reflect on how to assess the transformation and, and, and how to look into it. Uh, and this goes under multiple levels of assessment because we want to know uh, from faculty how they feel uh, how they felt when they applied uh, the i5 framework and how they felt when they are more let's say playful in their classroom or doing different things the understanding this transformation the faculty level for us is important uh, of course in some cases it's also interesting to uh, uh, assess how the framework has been applied and etc. But the student piece, on the other hand, is also important. Like if they are being uh, uh, impacted by and how they feel this intervention, if they see some transformation and etc. So the assessment piece for for our five goals in in multiple ways in, in different levels for it. Uh, so faculty level, understanding faculty transformation, uh, but also student level, how they are feeling, how they are impacted by some I-5 intervention in this process. Um, so we, I, again, as I said, uh, the program is new, so we still figure out the best way to approach that, to understand that. We're doing some research, some in-classroom research, I'm, I'm following some faculty during interventions to understand the best way to assess and the best way to see the transformation. Of course, in the future, what we want to see is that if, if those skills are being developed through I-5 framework, uh, but this is a future question and it will be a future uh, assessment because we don't doesn't even know like the timeline things to implement something and do some intervention when this is being, uh, this student being transformed for it or if they're being transformed for it or not. Um, so yeah different research, different discussions going around it uh, together with community. And, and, and then again, 
Oikos partnership law now for this uh, LIP research project and cohort. Uh, it's also a good resource to understand more about this impact. Thank you. Gustavo, maybe something that I maybe I missed it in what you were saying, but what, what triggers me a little bit is like it can be used at different levels. Huh? It can be used uh, to assess uh, student skills, but at, a, at the same time, it can also be used the framework um, to assess the transformation in the faculty. Um, what is the role of students in assessing the transformation of the faculty? Um, did you reflect or yeah, I know that you're starting with the framework now, but have you had conversations about that yet? Yeah, uh, when I when I talk about the the faculty assessment is uh, your individual assessment, like you as a faculty, like doing this assessment and reflecting about your practices, your transformation. It's not a student evaluating your. Of course, the student uh, can evaluate, let's say, the intervention and in a case like a, a different pedagogical approach, but but they're not evaluating the faculty through the framework, like the faculty itself, itself evaluating how they felt about this intervention, how hard it was to do with the transformation for doing something that are not used to do it, etc. So it's more an individual. Okay, thank you for elaborating on that. Um, Hermonimo, Simon, do you wish to uh, to react on uh, the assessment uh, part? Um, yeah, maybe um, this uh, this thought, uh, as I said before, to the learning methods uh, and learning approaches, I think it's also important uh, for faculty development and curriculum change. I think uh, it, it, the students are very important. They should be involved really as as real a partner on uh, um, which have also power. Um, and also uh, some some extra uh, university partners who are interested and who want to develop, then I think uh, the, the curriculum and the, uh, would be better and would be more um, useful for or, or um, yeah suitable for for this change we have. And 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 um, but I think that is a, a long way to go. This I'm in, in Switzerland. Uh, we are not at at and uh, on this point. Okay, thank you, Simon. Hieronimo, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you all for sharing those insights. Um, that's really appreciated. I think um one of the first things that it might be important to just consider is what is the the role of assessing um something like reflection um what does it bring a lot of added value uh i, I think that's just an interesting question i, I don't have the answer to <laughs> but I, I just want to kind of pose that question to everybody um because we're often so uh, used to quantifying and seeing things with metrics which i think can provide useful um i guess points at in time but it also might be useful to say hey maybe we don't need to assess something like reflection. Maybe the activity in and of itself is a success, um, but I'm not 100% sure. But I, I think an interesting way in which we could uh, maybe, I guess, gauge is, is first, is acknowledging that it's important to embed these characteristics within oneself. So if, if we're ever gonna assess anything, it might be very useful to first focus on the internal component of that um, and yeah, that's basically my point there. Uh, in addition to that, I wanted to talk about the importance of uh, maybe building on some of these skills through outdoor learning. I'm not sure like how many of you have the capacity to engage in outdoor learning activities, but I feel that through those activities, um, you know, you really get to see some of the characteristics that we're talking about today, or really get to maybe develop some of them as it relates to openness, as it relates to self-awareness, as it relates to complexity, because with nature, there's so many of these variables that are just embedded within it. Um, so yeah, we just advocate for, for the integration of outdoor learning wherever possible. Well, thank you for bringing that up, Geronimo. I think it also resonates somehow with what Simon was saying, like this, uh, in the beginning, you, you explained the, the triangle, like you have the students, you have the university, and you have the, yeah, Geronimo now calls it the outdoor world, the outdoor learning. Um, how outdoor um, 
can out or be um, maybe um, maybe that's maybe the last question I would like to ask like how can we scale that up um, so that we can really interact with society with nature to bring this relationality with 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 other humans with animals with the living species um, um, into students and people and teaching people etc um, Simon, maybe you can reflect about it because it was part of your triangle. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for, for this thought. Yes, uh, outdoor, like uh, you mean, maybe in nature. Uh, and I also think that is uh, very important here. Uh, and I think it's not only in Switzerland. Uh, it is um, a, a big development from schools. That, that's a really a program, Swiss wide program, um, teaching outside. And uh, not only biology, everything, mathematics and, and language and everything. And um, that's very interesting because there are a lot, uh, a, a lot of, of, of good um, skill, uh, skills you can develop there, as you said. And now the question is, is it also possible at the university level? Is it possible to bring, to bring students uh, and teachers out? Uh, is it uh, scientific enough? And so, um, and and that's a big question for me. Maybe you ha you have uh, some of you have a, a, an idea about what's possible for universities to teach like this. That's a question towards me personally, maybe, or is it to the other panelists? Well, <laughs> <not there. laughs> no, no. It's I think it's an intriguing question because we have very often this. Um, uh, problem of having to to teach to 500 students at the same time um, and and that's something yeah, that um, it, it, it limits your possibilities and I think it limits mm -hmm. possibilities for true transformations um, it limits sometimes your your possibility to just cognitive uh, learning and, and um, not really uh, uh, attitude change etc so um, yeah I think that's that's I don't know how to answer that question because I don't know the solution yet. Or I think it also has to do with the system itself and the way it is financed at the moment. Um, but okay, maybe maybe the other uh, panelists have an idea on that as well. If not, that's maybe in a uh, in, uh, question that we can uh, take along with us for a uh, the next higher higher education summit of or maybe for tomorrow for the for the leadership session um so um because i see it's uh, 10 past five and uh so unfortunately we have uh, to close this session uh it was really intriguing uh to to get to know all these uh, frameworks um i don't know whether someone wants to ask uh, from the audience a final question um i don't see questions in the chat uh at the moment i'm scrolling through it so um well maybe geronimo, geronimo you gave me an idea to close this session um because you were talking about um the purpose of assessment and um yeah, the internal um yeah internal growth um maybe based on what you learned all of you um in this session from each other is there maybe an action point for yourself that you would like to formulate um, for your inner growth um, to help higher education uh, institutions to be more transformative. Um, can you formulate an action uh, for yourself that can help higher education institutions in that direction? Um, who wants to go first? Okay, I see that Daria also has a question. Um, so maybe we can go to Daria's question first so that you can think of uh, that uh, final question to you. Daria, um, please. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if mine is easier, but I'm just curious. Uh, something that uh, that Geronimo brought up and uh, Simone tackled a little bit uh, through also this this triangle when it comes to outdoor outdoor learning, which I also relate very much to experiential learning. I'm curious, um, 
as people who are also sitting within the system in different roles. Uh, so Gustavo mentioned that he was a lecturer or a facilitator before, and now he's working something else. Ella, very similarly, Jeronimo is a student, um, but also sitting in different um, different roles. Uh, Simone as well, from a, from a different perspective. How could you, within your role, encourage institutions to move towards this experiential or outdoor learning. Because something that I, for example, witnessed um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, I was invited to, to be a judge for Financial Times uh, Responsible Business Education Awards, actually for responsible business schools. Um, and one of the main questions or the main criteria for actually uh, judging the, the holistic approach of the um the responsibility of a business school and their efforts in the in the in the multidimensional context throughout the last three years was how they actually interact with the outdoor learning beyond academia and something that i saw that was very challenging for many schools and they didn't unfortunately had a lot of examples so i'm curious how could you within your role actually encourage and empower and shift this mindset on an institutional level, potentially. I hope the question is clear. And I know it's not an uh, easy one, but I'm just curious. Well, maybe we can synthesize both our questions into one then, Daria, because I think that's a very nice question uh, mm -hmm. that, can, can, that can close this session. Um, yes. Maybe I can start with the first uh, little answer. I think what helps is uh, to encourage uh, lecturers is to have good uh, example examples from other universities or other colleagues, then uh, people and lecturers uh, encourage themselves and think, oh yeah, maybe I could also do do so. Um, that's much more better than when I I came from outside and say you have to do this and this. So good examples, um, I think that that's that's very helpful. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, um, I think one uh, one of the, well, multiple answers to that. Like when uh, when we talk, for example, about the playbook and, and the building of a community of practice, really getting different people all around the world sharing what they're doing, and then you can get inspiration, learn from each other, etc. Uh, so this is one thing. The second thing uh, when we talk about experiential learning. And of course, going outside and connect with the nature, it's important because, well, uh, uh, it's something that we lost as humanity. So it brings the students to feel and to be sensitive to, to a cause and an issue that is really important. But also my perspective, I think it goes beyond just nature. Uh, it's putting our students to interact and to feel, to be empathetic. We different issues related to sustainability, not just, of course, nature is important, but also societal issues uh, um, and, and diversity issues, et cetera. Um, and this like being um, from a global community as Prime, for example, we see students, let's say from Europe, interact with students from India or even in Brazil, like understanding multiple issues and, and getting a, this sense of the challenge and, 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 and the problems that other societies or other regions have and on it. So um, this is part of experimental learning, uh, experimental learning process. Um, but I think it's it, faculty engagement is important, as I said, like uh, sensitize faculty to do the change and to transform. But I think the issues is really uh, uh, bigger than that because we need to rethink all the institution university ecosystem that means not just faculty itself but like the way that uh, uh, university institutions are being accredited the, the way that they're hanked the way that they're being evaluated etc because we have a pressure from students if students want that students want to be connected with the nature with social issues etc cetera, etc cetera. But like the institutional ecosystem is not ready yet, are not doing the change yet. Uh, uh, so this is also tricky because it's by faculty being engaged to transform the students want, want this kind of issue. But like the ecosystem that is evaluating or ranking uh, the university is not ready for that yet or so, or is not considering this as part of evaluation. That's why. And it's not that you mentioned uh, uh, Financial Times, Darja, because uh, I, need, I think they're pushing this change like uh, uh, this recognition now uh, it's new 
and is really important because it incentivizes universities to do some change because uh, uh, in the end, we need rankings, we need accreditations, we need et cetera, because this is how it is. Um, so I think the ecosystem transformation is really important. And this is one of uh, the things and answering uh, your question, Don, in a personal level, but also as an organizational level to push this advocacy, to talk with different stakeholders on the ecosystem to, to reflect on the importance of this change. Like they need to change the way that we teach, the way that we educate, and this ecosystem needs to change too. So uh, I think the ecosystem approach is also relevant. Thank you for bringing that up, Gustavo, um, for that it's not only in nature, the experience, that it's the full ecosystem, and it's also the understanding of the full ecosystem. Well, um, Ella or Hieronimo, uh, who would like to have the last word? Uh, no, you get both the last word, but who would like to get the last word first? <laughs> um, I'm happy to keep it brief. I'll keep it on the personal level because I'm also in charge of a program um, at the at one of the Zurich universities. Uh, we have an impact module and it hurt me a little bit that we were stuck in a classroom for the whole module. And I'm very um, inspired. And Simon, I'll talk with you later. Maybe you have some good ideas where we could actually um, host that module elsewhere so that they feel inspired um, by nature, not just talking about it in a classroom setting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this forward for me. And the other thing is if you're using online tools like Reflect, for example, um, use them to get students offline, use it to encourage them to go out into nature, to go out and talk to different people, um, there, there are ways to do this, setting challenges, setting actions, et cetera, so that, yes, they're being inspired by something that's happening online, but it's encouraging them to bring it into their everyday life, which is so much more multidimensional. Um, that's something that I would say as well, just to keep it nice and short. And um, to finish my question to, the, to everyone listening, just to go home with, I know you don't have to answer it now, is... Uh, what's 1% change that you want to bring into your own life? Because it starts with small things, not the big things. What's your 1% change? That's all I'm going to leave in the air um, as Geronimo shares his insights as well. Thank you so much for sharing, Ella. I've been reading the Atomic Habits book and that one chart that showcases the 1% change has just been on my mind uh, as you're talking about that. But um, in terms of some of the actionable steps that I hope to take on, are really to continue nourishing and building community uh, with other fellow students, with current recent graduates, so that we can advocate for change, um, whether that's at a, an individual like institutional level um, or trying to identify what are these other kind of key uh, barriers to change, as Gustavo was mentioning, whether that's accreditations and trying to formalize a community to advocate for changes within those systems. Um, that's going to be the goal. So just formalizing community and identifying the true levers of change. Thank you, Geronimo. Uh, thank you all four of you. Maybe it's, it would be also honest from my side to also share what I, uh, I would take as an action point. Uh, and I think that uh, I've, I'm very often in this kind of community where we are like-minded. Um, and it's very easy for me then to... Uh, Ah, to say we have to change this, we have to change this, but I take home with me that I will uh, uh, connect this community, this ecosystem here uh, in the Higher Education Summit with my other ecosystem, and that's the two universities that I'm working for, um, and I'll, I'll try to make sure that there's at least 1% uh, of colleagues, but I hope more, um, that I can somehow infect with, with what I've learned here today. Um, well, I would like to close this session and I would uh, like to thank all the four of you um, for each of your uh, contributions and frameworks that you brought with you from different perspectives, uh, from inner development, from pedagogical approaches, the holistic perspective, but also yeah, a reflection on the student's perspective. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, let's hope that we uh, do not lose touch and uh, get connected in the future as well. And to everyone in the room, um, I think I would like to say that we have a break now um, and that we would like to come back at uh, 5.30, I think. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye and enjoy the break. Thank you so everyone. much. Have you a so wonderful much, summit. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, enjoy your summit. Bye.
Welcome back, everybody. I see Anne is also joining us slowly. Thank you so much for joining uh, on a Friday evening. Uh, I do believe we still have two very, very exciting presentations. Uh, and I'm actually looking forward to hear uh, from Tom sharing a bit first and introducing our first presentation. Tom, right. would you take up the piece? Yes, yes, with pleasure. Uh, so uh, the next presentation is actually uh, one of the good practices that we were talking about before, um, and that is uh, very often shared in Flanders um, as a good example of a collective transformative learning space. And um, so I've seen the podcast in Flanders. I've uh, heard much about it, um, but we're still uh, wondering how it affects really works. Um, so I would like to introduce you to um, two people who will present um, the free space to make the world a better place. <laughs> I think that's uh, somehow the baseline uh, that you use in Dutch at least. Um, that's Thomas Remery and uh, Wannes van der Voorde. Uh, both uh, uh, are working uh, at the moment, I think, at Artevelde University College uh, in, uh, in Belgium. Um, Thomas is actually uh, uh, a lecturer and uh, was a lecturer before and still is a lecturer and uh, is a coach in this free space. Uh, and one is oneness. Uh, yeah, it's difficult the Flemish and the, the English uh, being mixed now. Um, you were actually one of the students uh, who experienced free space as uh, a learning space. Uh, and now you are at the other side. So I think uh, uh, it's very interesting to see that you have been uh, both perspectives uh, that you can share. So, um, Thomas and Wannes, uh, I would like to give you uh, the floor um, to present your research lab where you work together with students and lecturers uh, in an interdisciplinary research lab. Okay. Thank you. You can hear me? Yes? Yes, okay, we can hear Perfect. You and I'm trying yes. to share a PowerPoint. Uh, just checking. Oh, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh my God. No worries. Uh, if you if you click a share yeah. screen, you should be able to share your screen. I gave all of the permissions already. Yeah, but this is just some settings. Oh, I need to. <laughs> I need to go out of the meeting. I'm sorry. Uh, one second. I'm. I will be back. Uh, that's why they hired me because I can work with PowerPoint <laughs> and Thomas can't. <laughs> <laughs> that's maybe it's a generation gap then already that we're seeing here. <laughs> <laughs> that's the next step in the uh, in our uh, lab working. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I think he will be back in a minute. I hope so because we actually prepared the PowerPoint, but um, yeah. Mm. No worries. Um, I was also very happy that I had uh, the OICO students uh, at my side for uh, the technical stuff because that's also something that I'm not very uh, very yeah. skilled in, to be honest. It's changing a lot and very fast. The technological yeah. uh, revolutions with the artificial intelligence and, and things going on. Okay, Thomas is back. Yeah, and you even switched positions, so Thomas is yeah. now okay. on the right side of the screen. <laughs> okay. And let's try again. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, okay. Yes. So now you see uh, the presentation. Yes, perfect. Okay. So good evening. You have to unzoom a little bit. I think we just see a little bit of it. Mm. I can Unzoom. see everything, I think. You can see everything? Oh, yeah. so it's on my side. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, so welcome. I'm uh, Thomas Rinri. Like Tom said, I'm a lecturer at Artevelde University of Applied Sciences. I'm um, a lecturer in the teacher training program in early childhood education. I'm a science uh, lecturer there and teaching also sustainability education. But a big part of my job at Artevelde is uh, I'm a researcher. 
I'm a coach in Vrijplaats uh, doing research on um, sustainability education, on uh, science education, climate change education. And uh, like Tom also said, Juanes is one of the former students we had last year, graduated. Um, he has a background in physics, uh, Juanes, and uh, is teaching at the moment in the secondary school, but also the teacher training program of primary education and then also being a coach at uh, Vrijplaats. So like Tom said, it's, um, well, we don't see our, ourselves as a good practice, but as a practice, we are <laughs> working, we are sometimes struggling and uh, we are reflecting on what are you doing and uh, we see results. That means that we see uh, students grow uh, within our, within Freiplatz. Um, we see some, uh, we, we have some nice stories that we, we can share with you today. Uh, so in that, in that, in, in Maybe that's why we, are, we, we you could see us as a kind of good practice. Uh, but what is Vrijplaats is um, a living lab uh, at Artevelde University. Um, while we are struggling a bit with this label of living lab, you could say, okay, we start from real life experiences and we, we have this kind of collaboration and co-creation with students and partners. But uh, I think reflection is, is a big element of Vrijplaats. It's also a physical place at our campus. So we have a kind of physical free place there where we can meet with students, where we can work together. Um, you, see, you see a picture of it uh, and you will find out more about it in the presentation. Um, we have a mission and, and this is already stated by, by Tom. Uh, we will, well, we, we are kind of co-creative transformative learning space. And um, well, together with the professional fields, with students, with researchers, we want to design learning environments to enable transformative learning. So, um, and then by designing this learning and co-creation uh, with and for and in uh, the practice and true practice, we, we want to try to implement action competencies for sustainability. That's what we are working on. Um, we want to make connections. That's really important in Vrijplaats. It's a place where we make connections. We build bridges between different elements. So we have the curriculum at our uh, yeah, teacher training program because uh, Vrijplaats, it's a, you could say it's part of the teacher training program. Um, so we want to make, we want to start from the curriculum with the students and we want to make connection with research. That means that we have research projects that we worked on together. We have some service design and we have worked with different partners. Just to give you an idea about the, the size of our uh, organization. Um, so we are with eight coaches. That means eight lecturer, lecturers from our university who uh, work together. Um, we have a group of students. Well, last year we had a big group of students, 40 students. Um, now we have a group of about 10 to 15 students within our living lab. And it's important to emphasize this because last year we had a really big group, which was exciting, but was also really um, difficult to work with. Uh, and that's why we said, okay, we downsized it a bit more this year. And uh, we prefer to have 10 students or 15 students for longer time in our lab than 40 students who are only there for a short time of period. Um, so that's already what I said, students, uh, join us because they do their internship um, within Vrijplaats. It could be different internships. Uh, it could be students who are with us the full year, uh, this, in their, their last year of their bachelor, that they take this, this kind of graduation internship, like one is did. Um, and these are really the interesting profiles we have because we could work a full year with them. We could do a lot of things. But also we have some students who have kind of more... Um, shorter internships of four weeks, for instance, then you do community service learning internship. Um, and okay, they also collaborate with us in projects. Um, and we also have students who did who did bachelor thesis within Vrijplaats. So they, they work on specific topics for their thesis linked to the project that we are doing. Um, yeah, and like I said, it's a bit embedded within the teacher training program, but uh, we also have students from other departments within our lab. So it's not only confined to the teacher training program. We also have students from pedagogy of uh, early childhood education. We have students from graphical design, uh, social, um, so social work, and so on. So we want to have this kind of 
multidisciplinary groups with students from all different department, dark departments with different backgrounds. Like I said, research, uh, we do a lot of research. We have some projects on sustainability, sustainability education, climate change education. Uh, Let's Stem Together is a project on science education in out of school context on incl inclusive projects. Uh, Beauty Markers is a project we have also on, on science education, STEM education, uh, linked to uh, circular thinking. Um, we have some service design. That means we have some collaborations with organizations, with schools, NGOs, with uh, Flemish, Flemish government departments, with the city of Ghent, where we have some projects that we develop some tools for them. And of course, like I said, we work together with partners, which could be schools, teachers, educators, experts, organizations, youth organizations, and so on. So we have a whole mixture, um, a web of connections that we try to make um, in Vrijplaats. Just to have some concrete idea about what we are doing, uh, I will just highlight one project that we we're working on. I'm, I don't have the time to go into detail in all the projects, but one of them was uh, Ducano. It's an organization, an environmental, environmental organization in Ghent. Uh, they provide these free canoes, like you see here, and children and young people can just go on the water in Ghent and collect waste. Uh, they are an environmental organization. They have a kind of uh, a mission. They want to reduce the amount of waste uh, going to the water and, and going to the oceans. And they want to, um, yeah, they, their aim is to develop a more sustainable city uh, to achieve uh, certain climate objectives. So they provide these free canoes. They are really popular in Ghent. Uh, that means that we have a lot. They have a lot of uh, schools going there. Um, uh, going onto the water with the canoes, collecting waste. Uh, then after the trip, they have the, this kind of waste challenge that they wait how, how much waste they collected uh, and, and a short quiz they give with the students. But they realized that, or they, they, they found out that their impact they have is not that big uh, because they see that there are a lot of teachers just going there. They see it as a kind of fun trip they have on the water half a day enjoying themselves on the water but they 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 want to have kind of bigger impacts they want they want that this uh, this trip they provide um uh, stimulates deeper learning with uh, students and, and young people and then they said okay they don't have knowledge on education or pedagogy and they contacted us uh, to have this kind of collaboration. We had a two-year collaboration with them just to design educational tools that could be helpful for teachers who visit their organization. So last two years, we worked together. We had some students who, um, well, we, we worked together with some schools, kind of pilot schools, uh, and tried to understand, okay, what kind of tools they needed. Um, we developed a kind of didactical framework uh, for the teachers and, and certain didactical um, lesson plans and lesson inspiration in order to uh, really work on this action competence of uh, students uh, and children in this, in this case. So we try to find educational answers for complex questions. We uh, design certain educational tools and all kinds of projects. Um, and that way we collaborate with uh, NGOs, city authorities, educational institutions, and so on. And uh, yeah, we work, the, the students work together also with us uh, we, who are practice oriented researchers. Um, and this is important. Yeah? This collaboration is really important. Like you see here, this is a picture of last year. One is, is also sitting on the table. And we have a mixture of people from an organization, um, researchers from our department, students within Vreerplaats collaborating together, working together. And we see these students really as colleagues. Uh, so they can take control of the process. They have ownership uh, of this process. Um, we, we provide them space to experiment, to develop things, to fail. That's something also I heard yesterday, uh, uh, creating these spaces for failure, to learn from mistakes you make. But in that way, you can um, refine products or tools that you are developing and make it better. So this kind of collaboration and, and creating this kind of atmosphere of working together, co-creating, sitting around a table uh, with people from an organization uh, is really interesting. So this is a, a kind of scheme we have. Eh? We have the question mark in the middle. That means that we have the, the, the focus point of our project that we are working on. 
and then the different stakeholders around it. So we have the students, and this is also what we sometimes what we want to do within this kind of project is that we want to have students with different disciplines and backgrounds together. Um, so it, it's not that if we have a project on um, like the Docano project that we only have students with biology background who will be working on this project, but we mix them with students with more uh, another background could be languages or could be uh, arts. Um, so that they could look from different perspectives to the, the question, the problem we have in the middle. Um, we also work on this community, which is really important. So students work in, in small project groups together on different projects. And then uh, once or twice a month, we have this kind of community that students could share what they are doing. Uh, we see this community as a kind of critical friend to what they're doing. So they can pitch um, what they have developed or some problems they have to get some inspiration. Um, and this is also really an important part of Fairplatz, this community building, learning together, uh, which is also an important char characteristic of this learning environment we have. We work on four teams. That's what I already said a little bit. We work on sustainability, sustainability education, science education, outdoor learning, and culture education. Um, and we also try to combine these teams within the project. So we, we look for different uh, uh, perspectives within within a project. I'm not going to do really into deep uh, into these uh, teams, but just to to give you some idea that uh, sustainability education is really on certain uh yeah this conceptual framework we have they're looking at the problem from a holistic way uh, from different perspectives the system thinking which is important uh, pluralism uh, uh, like having different viewpoints and opinions and and trying to empathize with different viewpoints which is important and also this action competence which is really important within system sustainability education Science education, where we have uh, really the, the inquiry process or the design process, which is really important uh, that we try to focus on. Um, outdoor learning, which is uh, trying to create this outdoor learning environment um, for learning in, about, through and for the environment, uh, which is really important. And then cultural education is the framework of culture in a mirror. Uh, from Van Heusden, uh, where we want to look at perception, imagination, analysis, and conceptualization, uh, some of the elements that we try to focus on within these projects. But I think important, we have one is, like I said, uh, a former student, and I think I want to give him the word now, just to explain from his perspective how it is to work with students within Veriplaats. Okay, go ahead, Juanes. Thank you. So, <clears throat> yeah, last year I worked for a full year at uh, Veerplaats as a student. Now I'm also a coach. And uh, the first thing as a student in Veerplaats is, is um, it's 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 a totally uh, different thing that you're used to uh, on, on the college or, or a University of Applied Sciences because um, we're used to getting a task and fulfill the task and get uh, evaluated on the task. And that's not that's not the thing what, that happens at Fairplatz. Uh, it's quite the opposite. It's learning how uh, to fail, and that's that's a really, um, like Thomas said, a valuable thing. Learning how to fail and failure is good, but do it again and to be critical, to be a critical thinker for the things around you and for yourself. And it's freedom. And the thing with freedom is it's it's very limiting sometimes because when a person gets all the freedom to do what he wants, uh, he doesn't know what to do first. So that, that was one of the things that, that immediately, um, how do you call it, uh, hurt a little. Uh, I have to say it with the words of Eve. Uh, hurt a little uh, with me and my other students. We didn't, we didn't know how to succeed uh, in the things we were supposed to do. We were not used to uh, not getting a task, a very easy, uh, straightforward task, and just, okay, let's do it, and uh, we will do it, uh, and then we get a, a score, and hey, everybody's happy uh, if you get a good score, and everybody's not happy if you if you yeah, you failed. So that's that's the first thing I really, really want to emphasize. It's, it's a totally different way of working and thinking. So that's the first part. The second part is, um, yeah, we're not used... Uh, we're not used to it that our um, 
as teachers or coaches. So they're next to us and not above us and or beneath us. So that's 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 a really strange thing for a student sometimes. But it's a really valuable thing that is it's real. You have real contact. You have real meaningful conversations. You uh, develop an environment of trust uh, with a lot of humor, but with a um, with uh, realness. So when I what do I mean with realness? If we have a conversation about something that's not going well, it's real. It's human. And a lot of times um, when the student and teacher are talking, it's still real. You're not doing really good, but it's from the viewpoint of you you have to succeed at something. And our viewpoint is, okay, what's going on and how how can we start over it? So it's, 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 a, it's a totally different thing. And Throughout the year, uh, I've I've learned some some critical things about myself too. I'm not a typical student. I'm a little bit a little bit older, but I've learned to be um, to take the initiative, to to think on a lot of different uh, um, skills of per perception. So yeah, I have a background in physics and biology. Uh, so every problem I view is from my viewpoint of physics and biology or science in general. But uh, by working with students uh, who are re really good at art or, or, or history, you, you, you get a very unique mixture of, 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 of the two. You get science on the other hand, and maybe arts of, of I don't know, uh, history, you name it. And you get a very interesting mixture. And at that cross line, where those two things converge, you find some really inspirational things. Um, that are outside of your um, comfort zone sometimes, but are ha that have a greater effect on students. So that that's that's another really really valuable thing. Um, and you know uh, the thing that I also learned is to be very critical um, against the, the the established school system. Yeah? Uh, so now I work. Uh, together with Thomas, but I also teach in a secondary school at high school. Uh, so and, and then you you get a really realistic viewpoint of what's going on with our education, and you you get a whole other uh, perception of it because you know how it could be if you do a little something just different. If you work together and you don't just teach physics, but try to teach physics and art, you get a really really nice combination uh, of things like uh, last year i worked on a, on a project for an ngo who asked who asked us to develop a, a educational tool about gender and migration and that's that's a really hard thing to do because yeah gender is a wicked problem and migration is, is also a wicked problem and yeah where do they uh, collide or where do they cross so a lot of research went into that and a lot of uh, prototyping so we we went to a lot of schools, tried it. Okay, that, that didn't work. We did it again. And most of the times that was also on the communities where everybody was together and we, we pitched an ID. And when when everybody is together, you get all the different kind of uh, viewpoints on, uh, on one thing. And it's, it's so, so uh, unique and valuable to see how different we are. All yeah, how all yeah, we, we all look different towards a problem. We all view it from another angle, and we all want to work on it on a, another on another level of angle. And when when those converge, yeah, you have you have a really beautiful thing going on, really. Um, like I I worked on a, 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 a on a project with an art student. I, I don't know a lot about art. I'm not a really, really good artist myself. I'm going to be very honest towards you. And uh, she had to, the, it, it was a project with sustainability. And uh, I, I said, oh, I want to work with trash. Just want to work with trash. And she had the idea, oh, maybe we can do uh, a living painting. So so you you, uh, you you take a painting, like with the girl with the pearl earring, and then uh, you, ma you make the props from trash. Okay, we were... We were talking and somebody else came and he said, yeah, but maybe you can do that in front of a green screen. You can Photoshop uh, the painting in the background and so on and so on and so on and so on. And it was one of the, the best workshops that, that, that they ever saw. 
uh, still. Um, so that's that's an example of it. Uh, uh, but I don't know. Maybe maybe there are questions uh, I can answer because it's a lot and it's it's very difficult to explain to somebody what what is it and how does it feel if you're not there for a long time. Okay, but just maybe thanks, Juanes. Uh, just to say that we um, like Tom referred to, we have a podcast um, which has uh, in English subtitles, so that could be interesting. Uh, then you can hear us talk in one hour and 15 minutes about Freiplatz, which could be interesting. Uh, if you want to, we want to learn more about it. Um, also, we give some our contacts there, our LinkedIn page we have. But of course, if there's time for questions, uh, we're happy to answer them. I don't see the chat, so I don't know where it disappeared, but I don't know if there are questions. I don't see any questions in the chat, Thomas. Okay. Um, oh, Thomas, you seem to be gone, or uh, not? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I was just wondering. Maybe I have a question, if I if I may. Um, okay. I was just wondering. Um, maybe it was an interesting exercise to try Freiplatz, um with teacher trainers. Because I'm actually quite jealous of your project. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. I think it's fantastic what you're doing, and okay. um, yeah, maybe it would be uh, somehow impactful um, to do a Vreplatz um, spin-off with teacher trainers. Um, yeah, definitely. And I think because what, what we see that's also what one is uh, explained is that we want teachers to be become designers, learning designers, and not. Um, being uh, executors of learning like just replicating what they have seen and and what they normally think they should do but think for themselves and that's that's really for us kind of um, motivation to to have this place kind of Vreplatz place what we also have seen is that some last year we had some students in Vreplatz we they were at the, the edge of a dropout from our department they said okay I can't take it anymore. <laughs> I don't see. I don't see how can I have a job within education for the rest of my life. And then we start talking to them and said, okay, maybe you could join us at Fairplatz. And they just realized that education could be more than the things they have seen two years before. Um, so they see the value of what they're doing and the power. Uh, and and this is really yeah a motivation for us uh, just to continue the work we're doing. Uh, because we see the impacts and we see how they grow and their confidence is growing and and they yeah they, they also find a way how they can use their talents they have their background they have the, their experience they have yeah, just just one thing uh, like thomas said yeah they they live very confident yeah um, when i started working in september in uh, high school i work on a very very uh, how do you call it uh, uh, challenging school. Uh, the first month of school, the they, they set the school uh, two times on fire. That kind of uh, um, receiving public, uh, you get very confident and you know what you're doing, and you can can adapt very very fast and improvise very fast. So it's the value I had over one year. I think I, it's it's irreplaceable for me, and that's why I'm still happy to be be around. Of course, so yeah. That's very nice that you say that, Ronas, because. Uh... It, uh, it reminds me of a master thesis project I uh, guided last year. Um, you, you might have met my student in your mailbox at some point. I don't think you participated in the end in the project uh, of her. But we, we screened somehow how um, ESD was present in some of the teacher trainings in Flanders. Um, and there it was really these kind of examples that actually show that this is working. Um, whereas in some universities, um, or universities of applied sciences, we also saw projects where there is sustainability education in the curriculum, but the teachers or the future teachers, they do not learn how to create or design, like you said, because I really like the terminology you use, how to design these kind of learning environments. And I think you're, you are very effective in that, um, or at least it seems convincing to me. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm a fan of it. <laughs> Thank you for presenting that here. Thank you. So much. 
Any other questions or curiosities from within the room? Or Spanish or Thomas? Maybe just one um, uh, 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 detailed question. Uh, one is, uh, you spoke about these wicked problems, gender on and migration. So you also addressed it with that same approach? Is that uh, it? Yeah. So <clears throat> the thing is with gender and migration, it's very hard to um, develop an, uh, an educational tool, tool that, uh, how do you say it, that contains the focus, balanced, um, in mig migration and gender. It's very hard to keep that balance. If you make an educational tool, or it swings to migration, or it swings to gender. But the thing is, and that was very funny in our research, there isn't, uh, to this day, to my knowledge, and I did a lot of research, uh, there isn't a tool that researches the, the borderline. So the process um, and, and getting that ID on Vreeplaats Took six months as a team. Where are the where are the the cross lines? How do how do they um, strengthen each other? Yeah, the effects of of gender and migration. So we oh, we had a lot of stories from from India Aravalis who are not uh, it's a it's a subgroup in uh, India who are not getting uh, acknowledged for being a human even. So they had a, a flaw there. Uh, they they, you know, they they didn't get support. They were being. You know, Killed, eh? they were death, uh, and and um, like uh, other NGOs went there and counted the bodies, uh, the the passports, but they had they didn't had one, so they were never 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 uh, in the in the system to begin with. So that's the story being untold, and that's one of the stories we we eventually used in in our educational uh, research. But to get to all those those the, the, those um, epiphanies, because it's our epiphanies. It's it's a really long process and it's not that easy to do. So yeah, the the you know, the whole way of thinking in Vreeplaats uh, really really you know, helped with that because it's thinking out of the box, actually all the time. <laughs> if you get my uh, get my my point. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Thomas and Manas. Uh, and thank you for sharing also with uh, with the rest of the participants uh, this incredible movement that you also observed that is growing. Uh, I'm so actually happy to hear when an initiative or a program uh, says we see and we can observe the impact and we already kind of can recognize it, we can identify it because that's also a struggle that I do believe a lot of uh, or different organizations and initiatives are actually struggling um, within this ecosystem. So uh, this brings me inspiration and, and hope to also learn from you and uh, your ideas and your approaches. And thank you for sharing it with us. Um, and I would actually love to invite now Rad and Dominic to actually share with us a little bit of their presentation when it comes to young persons guide into a future. Welcome. So what I do know is that, um, and I will actually give both of them the words to introduce themselves, uh, but Dominic uh, is working at the Rasmus University of Rotterdam, KU Leuven, um, as a PhD candidate, uh, and uh, Rad is uh, currently employed at Club of Rome, and she both had uh, amazing experience uh, co-creating and co-learning for this guide, and I'm very curious about your presentation. So the floor is yours. Do tell us a bit more about yourself and then also um, about how we guide ourselves into the future. Thank you so much for this introduction. Yes. Can you guys hear me and can you guys see my screen? Yes, perfect. Awesome, perfect, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm Dominique. I'm now a PhD student at Erasmus University. And what we're going to be presenting is something that started when Rad and I were both uh, at KU Leuven, but has continued since. Um, and just a heads up, I'm currently, uh, I have COVID. So I think I'm making sense, but this is my first attempt at doing something else than 
drinking tea and sleeping. So if I'm not making sense, I sincerely apologize. So bear with me. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Rad, and I'm currently working for the Club of Rome for an impact hub they have called the Emerging New Civilizations Impact Hub, uh, in which I am the program coordinator. I am originally from Bangladesh, and I'm by training, I'm an anthropologist. And together with uh, Dominique, I we um, we engaged in this um, in this really remarkable journey that which is what I'm going to be starting the presentation with. So um, Dominique, yeah. So this is us, and maybe I'll tell you a little bit of the story here, and then um, what came out of the story, and then Dominic can take it forward to how we are now engaging in in forwarding this practice that we have envisioned. Um, so it started with a group of students at the University of KU Leuven, of which Dominic and I were a part. And this initiative was conceived within the framework of the honors program known as the Transdisciplinary Insights, where a diverse group of students collaborated over the course of a year to tackle what is commonly referred to as like a wicked problem. So we worked on the STEAM Plus project. Um, what made this project truly exceptional is the rich tapestry of backgrounds that came together to form our group and hailing from various academic disciplines, nationalities, and encompassing a mix of bachelors and masters and PhD students. This collaboration was a true melting pot of ideas and perspectives. And guiding us through this very intellectually stimulating journey were none other than the students who had gone through this program the year before and had created the Young Person's Guide to the Future as their um, project um, output. Um, and that also included Anne Snake, who is in the room with us right now. Um, so this continuity and this shared mentorship, it created a unique sense of interconnectedness and commitment to carrying forward the spirit of innovation and space of discourse. So our quest was not merely to solve a problem, but to inspire change and to create a project that transcends the boundaries of academia and spark a reimagining of how we approach education. So in our dialogues, a recurring theme was the potential constraints within higher education that might restrict the perspectives of students. And recognizing this, we determine, determined to forge a project that could be seamlessly integrated into the educational system, acting as a catalyst for inspiration and change. Our brain, I remember our brainstorming sessions and within our brainstorming sessions unfolded a plethora of ideas uh, challenging the conventional norms of higher education. Some ideas I remember we discussed were, why not replace lectures with engaging podcasts? Why imagine transforming the traditional lecture format into a dynamic talk show experience? Um, picture classes conducted outdoors, immersed in nature, rather than confined within the walls of a lecture hall. We envisioned a shared space where students and professors from diverse disciplines live and collaborate, breaking down the barriers that typically define their academic worlds. After this exhaustive brainstorming, our vision crystallized into a project that extends beyond the confines of higher education. We sought to create a tool that imparts the values of transdisciplinarity systems thinking and critical analysis to anyone who engages with it. Our project is not just a response to a challenge, but a catalyst for a broader movement towards a more inclusive and dynamic and effective education system. So our specific focus centered on a question that resonates deeply with the urgency of our times. How can we better prepare students for a more sustainable future? Um, so through weekly meetings marked by spirited discussions, book readings, workshops, movie screenings, and even the unconventional inclusion of online games. Um, our collective exploration gave birth to some birth to a game called Flipper the System. Um, the idea was to create a board game which can teach players about this transdisciplinarity and the importance of working together in a fun way. Flipper the System is about working together to solve problems. It focuses on transdisciplinarity, systems thinking, and critical thinking. Players go through a series of environmental problems and have to collaborate to solve these problems. There are four characters, and each of them has certain resources that are needed to progress through the game. In addition, each character has a personal goal and a common goal, which they have to balance in order to complete the game. Thus, we have to work together. All players have different expertise, and you 
need each other's resources to solve the problems. Flipper the system is not just a project. It is a manifestation of our collective dedication to reimagining education for a world that demands sustainable solutions. In essence, our journey was not just about solving a problem, but about flipping the system, turning conventional approaches on their head to create a more sustainable, equitable, and forward-thinking educational paradigm. Uh, now I'd ask Dominique to take us forward and tell us how far we really did take Flipper. Yes, because the story of Flipper didn't actually end there. Uh, in the next year, after our project had sort of officially ended, um, we continued with a subgroup of people from our original team to work on Flipper together with a group of students from the Ho West University of Applied Sciences, where they have basically like a game development program or officially it's called digital arts and entertainment but there's basically basically a lot of really smart people there who can develop games into actual video games so that's what we ended up doing um with a group of students they transformed our board game into an actual playable computer game where uh you walk on a polluted island so you can on this slide here you see an actual screenshot from our game. So this is the actual island where you're playing on and you're with a group of four players and you walk around on this island and you encounter these challenges uh, based on the challenges from our original board game. Um, and as you walk around the island, you have to solve these problems together in order to get further and slowly clean the island of pollution. Um, on the slide, I actually put the link to the website for Flipper the System. So if you want to read more about our game or more about our collaboration with Hovest, or if you want to download the game and play it for yourself, you can. Um, please go to this website. And in a bit, I'll post the link in the chat as well so that you have it. So this is just to illustrate that if you come together with a group of passionate people, it doesn't end sort of when a program ends or when a curriculum is over. Um, people will sort of find ways to continue with something that they're passionate about. And I think this Flipper the system is a really good example of that. So uh, Flipper ended with making this game and then sort of trying and talking about it in these meetings, but there's so much more that we continue to do even after um, our challenge or sort of official challenge ended. Um, so the Young Person's Guide to the Future is still alive and kicking. Um, we actually ended up becoming coaches for a new group of students students in the next year uh, who worked on a, cha a challenge called Reclaiming Education, um, which is then sort of the third generation of the Young Person's Guide to the Future. Um, and other people from our group uh, or from other challenges that were related to the Young Person's Guide to the Future also ended up becoming coaches. So you can really see sort of this ripple effect that we're having here, where you start, you start with a group of people and then slowly it sort of ripples out and more and more people join. Um, so as we were coaching this Reclaiming Education Challenge, there was also a challenge about the Anthropocene and there was another one about decolonizing nature. And these were all sort of people from, from our group. Um, so we had this really exponential growth in this year. And in the Reclaiming Education Challenge, the students that Rod and I coached imagined alternatives to the higher education system. And what they ended up doing uh, was writing a manifesto. So where we as sort of an end product created Flipper the System, they ended up creating a manifesto in which they call for like several different changes in the higher education system. Um, so yeah, that's another example of how this can this ripple effect uh, happens and, and continues to grow. Um, and we also want to point out that we ended up doing side projects with different generations of Young Persons Guide to the Future members combined, and that sort of continues to this day. There's this sort of smaller example called the Be Move project, where we ended up with like different generations of coaches working together for one week, brainstorming uh, local solutions uh, together with people from other universities. So we all sort of had to focus on the city that our university was based in. So for us, that was Leuven. And we ended up creating this idea to make Leuven more sustainable and make it a better place for bees, uh, which was really fun. But this is just to show that sort of, we continue to connect and try and find sort of uh, places where we can we can share this, this vision that we have um, with other people and spread the word. Um, and what is actually way cooler, but maybe Rod can share a little bit more about this, is that Rod and Anne end up writing a Goonie article um, also about sort of the, the type of things that we were thinking about within the Young Person's Guide to the Future. Rod, you're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so we did write an article. I, Anne and I co-authored an article 
about um, shifting or transforming higher education. And in that article, we tackle the urgency of today's crisis driven by issues like mass species, species loss and greenhouse gas escalation. We discuss how human behavior shaped, shaped by the Western development model and colonialism contributes to these challenges. And we propose a transformation for higher education institutions to become ecosystems that co-create life aligned knowledge, emphasizing the transdisciplinary learning for a regenerative decolonized world. Sorry. So our experiments with learned river programs within the complexity-based frameworks are promising, but we also address that rapid policy changes are essential for uh, widespread adaptation of this. Thank you, Rod. Yeah, and the article is, is really cool. Um, so yeah, that's another example of something that, that we've been doing or that people from the Young Person's Guide to the Future sort of continue to do. Um, because there's a lot going on, we de decided to create this sort of online space. So we made a LinkedIn page, which is just called Young Person's Guide to the Future. The link to that is also on the slide. So if you want to stay up to date with the sort of things that we're up to, um, please follow us there. Or it's also, I guess, become this sort of archive of things that we've done in the past. So there are also posts about Flipper the System, for example, and I, I think the Goonie article is also on there. So if you want a nice overview of everything that's been going on and that will continue to go on, please follow us there and and join the community um and things continue to happen so only a few weeks ago rod and i uh, also with Anne, actually uh we were on a farm in belgium for a weekend which was organized by Anne, uh where there were people from all over europe uh and also a couple of uh, young persons guide to the future alumni so not just me and rod but a bunch of other people as well which was a really nice space for us to reconnect with uh the people that we met uh, back in leuven but also to again spread the word to other people and this time to people uh all over europe so that was a really really special special experience and really cool. Um, and we ended up forming this group, which we call ourselves the United Peoples, uh, which again, this sort of is this community, but this time with people from really all, all over the world um, working on sort of similar things that we, we've been discussing now. So how can we sort of create like hopeful visions for the future? Um, and all of this, all of this, I'm just saying it to sort of illustrate that what once started as this one year long challenge as an extracurricular activity uh, has grown into so much more uh, and that us as Young Persons Guide to the Future members continue to be active in other pro projects and trying to make changes in, in various ways. Uh, so continuing on that, uh, what are we actually doing now? Um, Rat, do you want to get started on this or should I get started? Um, I can. Um... If from my perspective, I am now working in the Club of Rome and um, engaging with the Club of Rome with the various partners all over the world to to enact uh, this transformational shifts um, of uh, of civilizations and societies and and a lot in education as well. Um, uh, for me in particular, I am involved in a lot of projects that really look into this um, regenerative education or more inclusive education as well. For example, I'm we are engaged in uh, the reframing the role of research for society. And there we have really important, ask really important questions and investigate this uh, uh, the questions of how can research best address the complex challenges we face today and what can be done, done to transform the role of academia more specifically academic research as it addresses, as it exists to address uh, present crises. There's also other, another project that we do that's um, more with basic sciences and we question our, and the very focal question there is our basic sciences as they're now best equipped to address the complexities of the world today. Um, and the inclusion of uh, traditional indigenous science as well as social sciences and the humanities is very important in trying to shape education in the future. Um, and of course, in every step of the way and in every and in and, and in every engagement and project that we are involved in, there is this uh, there is this space of uh, always including the younger generations or opening the space for intergenerational dialogue to happen, so that there is like a there's a mutual understanding, a mutual learning in, in the process of going forward. Yeah, thanks, Rod. Uh, yeah, and for me, like I said, I'm now doing a PhD. So um, I'm actually studying the support provided to families who live in a context of poverty, um, because in Rotterdam, there are a lot of people who live in poverty. 
Uh, and what I try to do in my project is sort of challenge this notion of who is the expert. So I think as scientists, you're somehow often trained to think of yourself as the expert, but this project, we're talking to professionals who are providing support to families who live in poverty. And I also talk to a lot of parents themselves. And in this context, if we want to find out sort of what the support that they're given looks like, but also how it is experienced by them and how it can be improved, we're as scientists are not the experts, we have to listen to them. So that, that's really what I'm trying to do at every opportunity. Um, and luckily people at the university really like what we're doing. Uh, they think it's really innovative, uh, which is sometimes also shocks me because it what we're doing is not that sort of special, but but apparently it is. Um, so for example, our ethics application, which was challenging because we want to do it in a different way, for example, to make it more accessible for people who maybe didn't speak Dutch very well. Um, our ethics application is now used as an example for other researchers um, to sort of look at it before they submit their ethics application. So slowly I'm I'm trying to think change things within the university themselves. And and right before our presentation, I was telling Rat that sort of at every given opportunity in my university, I've been trying to convince people all the way up to the dean that we need to give students classes on stuff like systems thinking or transdisciplinarity. And I think finally people are also starting to listen to me here because a professor from a different department or actually different faculty came up to me and he said, hey, Dominic, I have this amazing idea. I want to make this mandatory course for all of my students on systems thinking because I think it's essential that they learn this in, in this day and age. But we're looking for teachers. Maybe, maybe we can collaborate on something. And I was like, yes, yes, please, please come to me, send me an email. We, we can work this out. So I think uh, people are really starting to sort of create um uh the changes that i'm trying to make which is which is really fun to notice so yeah um now i really want to make sure that we have time for questions or comments if there are any so if anything that's on your mind please please unmute your mic uh or send it in chat or whatever um so we, we can talk to you um and also also feel free to reach out. Rod and I are both on LinkedIn. You can also send us an email if there's anything that you want to discuss afterwards. Um, and I also, once again, put the slides to, or put the links to our LinkedIn page and also to Flipper the game on the slides. I'll stop sharing now so I can see you again, yes. Thank you so much both for the presentation. Uh, really incredible work and something that I just wanted to uh, maybe ask, but also comment in a way because Dominic, you actually uh, kind of already answered my question uh, with these last few sentences, uh, something that was already throughout this day at the conference um, present was how can we projects that are extracurricular on the sidelines as you shared that this kind of project that became like that was just started as a sign like project as an extracurricular how could we make those projects and initiative act and in, in initiatives actually a core of our education and how can we use our role that we are currently sitting in to move the people towards that mindset um so you started already kind of sharing a bit, but if you have any other thoughts or or any any anything else you want to add, because you just shared about the 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 context or a situation with the professor coming to you and actually exploring and co-learning together and co-creating something that uh, you also both of you observe relevant. But I'm curious, are there any other smaller success stories or impact stories that you observe that that these kind of projects became? crucial on the institutional level as well? Uh, it's a big question. It's an important one, um, but I'm definitely not the the only one who, who can answer this. So Rod, if you have any ideas, please pop in. Um, I think once people start to see the, the possible outputs, so whenever we have the opportunity to talk, for example, about flipper the system and we tell people that we made an actual computer game people are like what you you did this it's basically sort of in your free time uh like kind of within the course but, but a lot of it was also sort of in our free time um 
people sort of realize the the importance of of having these type of courses um and not just as an ex extracurricular activity but sort of providing this learning opportunity for all students or i would even say all learners i i, I don't want to limit this to university settings um so I think that's just a starting point. Just just share your experiences, share your thoughts, share your ideas at, at any given opportunity. And at some point, someone will listen. I'm, I'm starting to be convinced of that now. Um, yeah, it's also a lot about having spaces or opening spaces for discourse that the Young Person's Guide to the Future does a lot, is that if you have a space for discourse um, and collaboration, we can always find people who are doing work which connects with our ours and then collaborate together to build something that is um viable right so this is also a very important thing to keep in mind in terms of educational structures and university structures it's also very important to see that uh teachers or professors or professors have an open mind to not just teach but also learn from students because it the learning goes both ways which is not the which which is not currently the the practice in university settings now and i think the a major shift can happen there once uh this the uh, practice becomes more mainstream can i just ask a question oh sorry navia you left you raised your hand i go after yeah my question is for that. Um, I'm really inspired that you're in part of this journey and not sure how you got into this whole project, but uh, how are you going to, uh, how are you going to bring this into Bangladesh? Because it's, I mean, places like India and Bangladesh, this is so unimaginable for me, like right here sitting, I feel like I'm privileged at the moment, because um, it's so parent driven and society driven and the education system is so much of pressure and you don't even have time to reflect and how uh, what is your take on that and how long do you think that it would take for us to change a system like that in in, in Bangladesh or India for instance yeah that's a very complex question but I'll I'll try to tackle it right um I think change is already already happening and not just change I think there are practices that are happening in 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 the spaces in very liminal spaces in Bangladesh or even in India or in Nepal where I have worked for a certain period of my life um there are there are practices and changes which are subject to the those contexts of India or of South Asia right and I have worked um, in the grassroots organizations there where I have seen people who create solutions for themselves and drive these solutions to their needs. So it's not really about adapting. So basically what we need to do right now is to again and always hammer in the fact that we do not need to learn the systems that are that are there in Europe. Rather, we have the solutions for ourselves that is that needs to become more mainstream and we need to adapt it more into our um into our context, right? So this is this is the mind shift break break that needs to, this is the mind shift transformation that needs to happen is that we need to move away from this colonial structure, which are very much embedded in our mentalities and our education systems and our structures to see that on the ground, the things that are happening, the emerging transformations that are happening are already there. The answers are already there. So I don't think it's gonna take a lifetime for that to happen. It's just, we just need to break away from this idea of, um, um, the educational systems, which are very, very Western and European. I have just a fast question about um, um, yeah, social diversity, because I, I'm, I'm actually uh, picking up a question that uh, Tom asked, I think, yesterday. I can't even remember. <laughs> We're so intensely into this. Has, um, this kind of extra engagement, uh, an honors course, for example, you have to be able to to allow yourself this luxury. You must not be a, you must not be obliged to work for a living uh, next to your studies to do that. Uh, in this sense, is it did, did you actually manage to have a sort of socioeconomic diversity in your groups and? Um, um the follow up uh, the, the 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 second uh, part of my question is yeah in order to avoid that it's just something for yeah people who have 
the uh, privilege to, to to spend this time on this kind of engagement. Um, integrating it in the main course, um, not having it anymore as a sort of voluntary engagement. Um, and um, if it's a main course, it has to be assessed. Will that still work in terms of dynamics, in terms of uh, all the, the sort of uh, everything that was sparked off by this great initiative? I'm not sure if I'm clear, <laughs> I'm a bit tired. Yeah, I think I think uh, I think I understood your question. So I I hope I'm gonna touch on all the aspects. And otherwise, feel free to to let us know if if there's anything else. Um, first of all, I I actually do think that we managed to have a very diverse group of people, uh, especially because the sort of the time commitment for this course was four hours a week. I think it was, and then I think our group we all just really liked each other, so we ended up sort of becoming friends, and then just informally hanging out and then of course yeah we would spend time on our project but it was also just like friends hanging out um but of course this was within a university setting so you people are there who have sort of the privilege to be there but but then again i know for example kia Leuven, there are a lot of people on scholarship so it's, it's really not, there is quite a lot of diversity there yes of course you have privileged students able to go to university but within that uh, group of people, there is a lot of diversity, I would say. But that's why I said before that this opportunity to learn and grow and, and come together as people shouldn't be reserved for, for people at the university and, and definitely not for an honors program. This this should be something that I would say every human being uh, on this planet uh, should be allowed to have this experience. Um, and then I forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> If it just becomes a normal course in order to, you know, to uh, not, uh, 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 yeah, not ask for a sort of additional uh, investment on top of your studies, will it not lose its spirit? And because it, you have to, has to be graded, assessed, and give you credits, etc. I understand uh, your concern in that, but I, I actually think that that wouldn't be really be a problem because at least for us it was such a unique learning experience and it was just sort of beautiful to, to be able to have this experience and I think in a in a way we were graded but we had to give each other uh peer feedback so we had to sort of give each other a grade and I actually think that's a great way of um yeah doing this because because you're not doing it for for a grade or a professor isn't grading you Yes, I think I think with this also, if I may add, we can also envision that we break away from this really uh, competitive structure of what is credits and this grading and all these things. And if it is, if it becomes part of this space of discourse and innovation and co-creation, can become a part of the uh, a part of the normal syllabus of a university, then I think it goes without saying that maybe this course is going to be something which is not going to be graded, but of safe and open space for students to come in and just discuss innovations and create and co-create projects, um, which is not, you know, motivated by points and grades and credits. And that is also something that the students uh, in the team that we coached uh, kept saying that that there's a demand for this because people are so driven by having to get good grades and there's so much stress and pressure on students. So having a learning experience where you can just learn without attachments, it's it's something incredibly valuable. Thank you so much. Any other curiosities in the room? If not, I would slowly close it here. And huge appreciation towards Dominic and Rad uh, showing up today and sharing their incredible work with all of us. I do believe that I heard at least they are very open to um, collaborate and co-learn uh, with anybody who has a, a dream or a guide for a future. Uh, so something that you could potentially reach out to them um, and uh, co-create. Thank you everybody for staying uh, on a Friday evening until 6.30. Uh,
Um, and we are going to slowly come to a close. And I would love, I would love to invite you all actually to uh, to Crest and join us again tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. where Elizabeth and Navia will open our third and the last but not the least day, uh, which will follow up with the panel discussion called um, Leadership for Learning, facilitated or moderated by Anne Snick. Um, and many beautiful speakers. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting and it'll be lovely to see many of your faces there. And then we will go into um, a proper self-reflection and the reflection of the whole conference, which we talked a lot about throughout the whole day today, I do believe, um, with Mario and Michael Winter uh, and slowly close this amazing journey and this amazing milestone. So thank you all for joining and I wish you a great rest until tomorrow. Thanks a lot for the facilitation and all the help, Dalia. Thank you so much, Dalia, everyone.